All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out uh, tonight and braving the rain uh, to, to be with us for this really interesting conversation. Uh, so welcome to the Brennan Center for Justice. I'm Ted Johnson, a senior fellow, senior fellow here at the Brennan Center. And we're grateful for the partnership with the New York University's uh, John Bradamus Center and the NYU Washington, D.C. campus to bring you this program. Um, we also want to acknowledge the work of Free Minds uh, Book Club and Writing Workshop, a D.C.-based organization that uses books, creative writing, community support to empower incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people at the D.C. jail, federal prison, and in reentry. We also want to thank the D.C. Congregation of Western Presbyterian Church for generously supporting the work of Free Minds and this program. As most of you know, Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to reform and revitalize and, when necessary, defend the systems of democracy and justice. It's just published a three-part series laying out bold policy reforms for candidates to embrace in 2018, uh, and they include ways to strengthen and energize our systems of democracy, ways to reduce mass incarceration, and ways to secure our constitutional liberties during a time of national security challenges. You can ch check those documents out at our website, brennancenter.org, and you can follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, so now let's get to our program. To get us started, I'd like to introduce Nia Malika Henderson, a senior political reporter at CNN. She will introduce our topic and our speaker for this evening, to, and then we'll have a discussion following. So please welcome Nia Malika Henderson. Hi, everybody. It's so good to see folks out here uh, coming out in the rain. Um, so tonight we're going to discuss the groundbreaking work of James Foreman Jr. He's written a book, uh, Locking Up Our Own. It's won the Pulitzer Prize. Congratulations. I don't, do you carry that prize with you, or how does that? Um, and so we, we all know the kind of broad outlines of the war on crime and the war on drugs, uh, how it began in the 1970s and led uh, disproportionately uh, to the mass incarceration of um, black and brown people. Foreman, however, he focuses on a part of this story that's less talked about, less known, and frankly makes some people uh, uncomfortable, and that is the ways in which African-American leaders in cities like Washington, Newark, Detroit, Atlanta, supported the tough on crime initiatives, the rule of law policies that led to the incarceration of millions of people of color across the country. In locking up our own, Foreman tries to explain the how, the why, and the who of mass incarceration. And what he found was that in the face of skyrocketing murder rates and the proliferation of open-air drug markets, black officials, pastors, elected officials, uh, you know, city council uh, members believed that they had no choice and that they were essentially responding to the pleas of their constituents who were beset by crime in their communities. A half a century later, we now know that the policies that they adopted have particularly devastating consequences for residents of poor, poor black neighborhoods. James is gonna talk for about 15 or 20 minutes uh, and lay out uh, what he goes over in his magnificent book and then I'll moderate discussion between Ted and James, and then we'll open it up to questions from you. Welcome, James. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Nia, for that kind introduction. I was, I don't know about y'all, but I'm the kind of person, I, I was telling Nia this, I'm the kind of person that I watch, a lot of times I watch CNN and I'll have the sound on kind of low and I'll be working and I'll be working away, working away, and there'll be the panel up there, and people will be talking, and it's like da da da. And then I've seen Nia get a minute and I get some time, and I'm like, okay, let me hear what she has to say, because she's going to say something that's interesting and important. And then she talks, I nod, and then somebody else comes on, and I'm like, I go back to work. Um, so I want to I want to thank uh, uh, Ted and and Mellon and the folks from the the Brennan Center. Um, I, I want I to especially want to acknowledge Free Minds Book Club. Now, there's something really specific and concrete and small but big that you could do if you want to support this organization, which is, so this is an organization that uh, helps young people and adults uh, liberate their minds, free their minds th through their time of incarceration and then also afterwards. And right now, they're in the middle of a fundraising campaign uh, do More 24, 
And in the next 24 hours, whoever gets the most donations will win a big prize. So this afternoon, I donated $24. That's all there. I mean, you can give more, and I'll give more at some point. But today, I gave $24. And so if you uh, go to freemindsbookclub.org, you will see the link to be able to do that. You can go online. You can give $24, and we'll see um, who's the winner tomorrow. So you have to do it before tomorrow at noon, though. So, so, so get on the case. Um, the Pulitzer Prize, Neil was very kind to mention it. So it impressed my whole family, with the exception of my son. My son, Emeka, is nine years old, and not really very much that I do impresses him, including this. And the night of the, oh, everybody was all abuzz in my house. I found out at the same time the world found out. There's no, like, you don't have any warning. And everyone's all fired up, and calls are coming in. And my son's like, all right, yeah, whatever. And then I went online, and I showed him the screenshot. Because the way they organize the wars, for whatever reason, general nonfiction this year was right above music. And I showed him Kendrick Lamar and his dad back to back. <laughs> And even he, he like paused for a minute till he went back to like insulting me and ignoring me and all of that. Um, books are for sale. One thing I want to say about, and I'll be signing afterwards, one thing I want to say about that, very serious here, which is when I was, uh, when I was in college, I didn't have a lot of money and I was on heavy financial aid and I could never afford any extras, including something like buying a book at a book signing. So a commitment that I made at the beginning of this process is that anybody who wants to get a copy of the book should get a copy of the book at whatever you can afford to pay. So do not walk out of this room wanting a copy of the book because cost was an obstacle. Uh, go see the bookseller. Uh, they will hook you up. And, and I, you'll get the same nice signature from me regardless of the, the amount paid. Um, so please take me up on that offer. This, this applies to you. So let me just start by saying my motivation for, for doing this project. And for me, it really came out of the work that I was doing as a public defender. There are a lot of stories in the book, and one of the stories is of a young man that I represented by the name of Brandon. Brandon was a teenage client of mine, Washington, D.C., Superior Court, had pled guilty to and was being sentenced for possession of a gun and a small amount of marijuana. I was his public defender. And I had taken the job of being a public defender because I viewed it as the civil rights work of my generation. My parents met in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, in the 1960s. My dad was the executive secretary. My mom was a member of the organization. And their generation changed America. And when I say their generation, I know there's a few people in the room. This might apply to you. So when I say their, for y'all, I want you to hear me as talking about your generation, transformed this nation made it possible for African Americans of my generation to have opportunities unimaginable to earlier generations. Yet at the same time, with all that progress, I could see graduating from law school that the criminal legal system was the place where the unfinished business of the civil rights movement sat. We didn't have the term mass incarceration, but we already knew that one in three young black men was under criminal justice supervision. We knew that black women were the largest single growing portion of the prison system. We knew that the United States had passed Russia and South Africa to earn the dishonor of being the world's largest jailer. And I had seen some of this in my own life. I grew up, neighborhood I grew up in Atlanta was a working class, mostly African American neighborhood. And in my community, there were two huge buildings as a child. One was the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, two blocks away. And the other was a General Motors plant two blocks away in the other direction. That was the early 1980s. Now when I'm graduating from law school 15 years later, one of those buildings had shut down, doors closed, jobs shipped overseas, and the other had built an addition. I don't think I need to tell y'all which is which. So that reality and wanting to fight that struggle brought me to Superior Court, Washington, DC, to be standing next to Brandon. And I should say, I changed the names of my clients and of everybody involved in the cases. So his real name, it's a real story, but his name was not Brandon. I was asking for probation. I had a letter from a teacher and a counselor at his school. His mother and grandmother were there in court. They had been there for every court hearing. 
They wanted him to come home. The prosecutor in the case wanted him to go to Oak Hill. Now, for those of you that have lived in the city long enough, you remember Oak Hill. And like a lot of juvenile facilities, it had a nice name. Sounds good, right? Oak Hill. Masking a really violent and brutal reality. It was a place where drugs and violence were rampant. It was a place where kids always left, off, left out worse off than when they entered. The judge in the case, Judge Curtis Walker, he looks out in the courtroom. Now, he's an African-American judge, not unusual. About 40% of the judges, Superior Court judges, are African-American. He looks out in the courtroom, and he sees a black man facing sentencing, an African-American defense attorney, a black prosecutor. And he looks at Brandon, and he says, son, Mr. Foreman's been telling me that you've had a tough life. You deserve a second chance. Well, let me tell you about tough. Let me tell you about Jim Crow segregation. See, the judge had been a child in those years, so he'd lecture Brandon on what it was like. And he said, so here's the thing, son. People fought, people marched, people died for your freedom. Dr. King died for you. And I'll tell you this, he didn't die if you'd be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on and carrying, carrying that gun, embarrassing your family and embarrassing your community. That was not his dream at all. So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope one day you turn it around. But today, in this courtroom, actions have consequences. And your consequence is Oak Hill. They locked him up. And I was so angry, I was so frustrated that day. Think about it. The judge had taken the same history that I told you was my motivation for becoming a public defender and somehow flipped it on its head and used it as a justification for locking up another young African-American man. But as I began to work through my anger, and it's still very much in progress, I began to recognize the fact that the judge wasn't alone, and his perspective wasn't unique. I told you 40% of the judges were African American. The police force in DC was, and still just barely is, majority African American. The police chief then was black. The mayor was black. The city council that passed the gun and the drug laws that Brandon was sentenced under, majority African-American city council. The chief prosecutor in the city was Eric Holder. And even with all that representation at the local level, we still had the same racial disparities in DC that were happening nationally. So the question that I faced was, how did this come to be? How was it that in a majority African-American community, as the nation was embarking on this 50-year project of building the largest prison system in the world, how was it that in a majority black community, we ended up making some of the same decisions? What was so powerful? What was so all-encompassing? What happened? That's the question of the book. I see there's some folks standing up. I please encourage you to come and find a seat. I am not bothered in the least. I'm a professor. I'm used to students walking out of class. So if you walk <laughs> into class, it's actually a celebration. <laughs> OK, so what happened? Very quickly. First thing we have to pay attention to is rising crime and violence and the toll that it took in the black community over this 50-year period, especially in this 1960s, the heroin years, and the 1980s and early 90s, the crack years. People remember the crack cocaine years or seeing the wire or otherwise have, a, have an, a, a, an idea. But heroin in the 1960s, that was crack in black communities before there was crack. The homicide rate nationally tripled in Washington, sorry, nationally it doubled. In DC, it tripled in the 1960s. Heroin, they tested everyone entering the DC jail. In the early 1960s, they found that 4% of the people, 1963, 4% of the people were heroin addicts. By 1969, the 4% had become 45%. That's an epidemic. And the reaction that it engendered in the community to write this book, I looked at letters that were written by mostly black citizens. The city was 70% African American in the 1970s, written to mostly black elected officials. 11 out of 13 of the first DC council were African American. And these letters reveal a kind of a pain and a suffering. People saying, we just fought the civil rights movement, and I'm afraid to walk my children to school. They're selling drugs on the corner. They're shooting in the park after school. There's there's violence everywhere. I feel like a prisoner in my own home. I feel like a stranger on my own streets. And at the end of these letters, there's always some version of do something. Do something. You have to do something about it. 
Now, who's receiving these letters? That's the second big argument in the book. The generation of people receiving these letters are the first generation of African-American elected officials to be elected in any number in this country since Reconstruction. Because of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, there's an 800% increase in black elected officials nationally in the 1970s and 1980s. It's an 800% increase off of like almost zero, but it's a big increase. These people, this generation, many of them are from the South, some of them were in the Civil Rights Movement, all of them remember the long history of under-enforcement and under-protection of the law in black communities going back for centuries. They remember. Right? My dad used to tell me this. He used to talk about growing up in Mississippi, south side of Chicago under Jim Crow. He said, we didn't call the police in a black neighborhood. They weren't going to come. And if they did, the only thing you could know for sure is they were going to make matters worse. They remembered Southern sheriffs in cahoots with the Klan, asked about homicide in black neighborhoods. They said, that's not a homicide. That's another dead black person. And they didn't use the words black person. So now, knowing that history, shaped and formed by that history, in office, this generation is bound and determined to try to use whatever power they have to make the law respond to people who had for so long been ignored and unprotected. OK. Crime is rising. There's a racial justice motivation to respond to it. But why police and prosecutors? Here's where this is a story that's about African American elected officials and the choices that they made. But it's also a story about the constraints and the limitations that they were under. It's also a story about their inability to choose. And let me tell you some of those, couple of those constraints, and then I'll wrap up. First constraint is historical. Black elected officials, overwhelmingly local, have been elected to represent communities that because of a history of slavery, because of a history of Jim Crow and racism and wealth discrimination, because of a history of building federal highways right through the middle of black communities, as they did in my hometown of Atlanta. If you've ever driven through Atlanta, you've driven on I-75, I-85. We're crazy in Atlanta, so it's 12 lanes. And every year, it's got more lanes. You are driving through, and you don't know it, what ha Auburn Avenue, what had been called the Black Wall Street, where Dr. King was raised, devastated and destroyed by the choice about where to build the highway. So these are communities that in many ways lack the resources to protect themselves without relying unduly on police and prosecutors for that protection. Second constraint is political. Black elected officials are local officials overwhelmingly. And one of the arguments of the book is that local government matters for how we got mass incarceration and how we're going to get out. But there's limits to what local government can do. And you see that in the book. For 50 years, black elected officials have had what I call an all of the above strategy to fighting crime and violence. They want more police and more prosecutors, but they also want, and they go to Congress and they ask for, more money for education and job training and mental health and drug treatment. They want national gun control to go alongside local gun control. They want a Marshall Plan for urban America. They say, do for black communities what you did for Europe after World War II. Rebuild, revitalize, reinvest. For 50 years, black elected officials have had an all of the above strategy. And for 50 years, they've gotten money for one of the above, law enforcement. The last constraint is one that we still suffer from today and that we're going to have to work collectively to liberate ourselves from. And this is that this was a generation that was constrained by their imaginations. There are a lot of examples of this, but let me just give you one. David Clark, known in this city. David Clark, I told you that 11 out of 13 members of that first city council were African American. David Clark was one of the two white members. Unusual biography, went to Howard Law School, Work for Martin Luther King, Poor People's Movement, becomes a lawyer for poor people, gets elected to the first city council. He's not a drug warrior. This is the thing you need to know about him for purposes of this example. He, the first thing he does when he gets into office is he tries to decriminalize marijuana. Doesn't succeed, but that's a, its own story. He's not a drug warrior. 
early 1980s. He's chair of the city council. Heroin, which had stepped back in the 70s, is back in force. And those letters from citizens that I told you about are increasing in number and increasing in velocity and ferocity. And they're saying things like, there are addicts. They're hanging out on the corner. They're nodding off on my stoop. They're gathering in the alleys. They're leaving dirty syringes. Do something about it. Do something. David Clark takes these letters. He sends them to the head of the relevant government agency. Who, he then gets a letter back. Council Member Clark, we've gotten your letter. Clark takes all that, and he sends it to the citizens so that they know their, their complaint got a response. All good. But who does this non-drug warrior, marijuana decriminalizer, forward the letters to? Remember, the problem is addicts in public space. Does he send it to drug rehabilitation, social work, mental health? No, he sends it to the police chief. Because even though he's not a drug warrior, like so many of us Americans, he's become conditioned to think of his only possible solution to the problem of an addict in public space as a problem that calls for somebody with a gun and handcuffs whose only destination to take you is the local jail. I'm going to stop here with one final point. The, one of the arguments in my book is that when we think about how we got mass incarceration and how we're going to have to respond, it's tempting to look at statements of presidents or particular acts of Congress. And those are important. But it's also critical that we look at these tiny, small decisions made across 50, county, 50 states, 3,000 counties over a 50-year period. These tiny little decisions that escape our notice, like the decision made by the head of a government agency about which other agency to enlist when they get a citizen complaint about an addict in public space, that these tiny decisions collectively over time, these are the bricks that together built the prison nation that the United States has become. Now, on that super, super lively, inspiring, <laughs> solutions-oriented note, uh, I'm going to end, but we're going to have a conversation. And during our conversation, and I hope during some of your questions, we'll also be able to turn to something that we're all thinking about tonight, um, which is what can we do in response? Thank you. Nice job, James. Thank you. Um, so I, one of the things, before I came here, I was talking to the folks who were doing my makeup, because I get makeup done. I think this is my third layer of makeup today. <laughs> but in talking to them, I was explaining to them uh, the, the book and mm. you know, sort of the conventional wisdom about mass incarceration really, I think, comes from Michelle Alexander, right? And people like ta Coates. And it's basically, uh, this was the white man, right? Uh, and so in talking to them about it, they were a surprise to learn about the ways in which black elected officials uh, pushed for a lot of these policies. They were also angry, right? They were angry. They were shaking their heads, you know. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I think one of the questions they had was, why didn't they know better? Mm. Uh, and that's, I mean, in reading the book, I kept being, I mean, you were very gracious, I think, <laughs> and non-judgmental in the way you laid out a lot of these folks. And everyone is in here, right? I mean, it's Eric Holder, it's Maxine Waters, it's Jesse Jackson, it's all the folks we uh, you know, sort of associate with black leadership. Why didn't they know better? Why didn't they do better? Well, I guess, I guess I, I have a couple different responses to that. And you're right, I struggled with that you know, as a writer trying to figure out what was the right place to land in terms of kind of looking for empathy and compassion and trying to put myself in people's shoes, but at the same time being clear that I was critical of the result of the choices that they made. Um, I think that, and so I think different people, the, the answer is different in a way for different time periods and different people. So take the 1970s. Marijuana decriminalization right. is being debated. The Doug Moore, black, radical, black nationalist city council member, also clergy member, is opposed to marijuana decriminalization. 
And at the time, and you might say, wait a minute, some, and he, his whole campaign was about black people and working class mm -hmm. and poor black people. Knowing what we know now, how could he have been opposed? But from his standpoint, he's looking at the heroin epidemic that had just devastated the city. You have people like Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson is going around to churches and civic groups, and he's saying, don't decriminalize marijuana because my son, Jackie Jr., was a heroin addict, and he started with marijuana. And this idea, you know, people scoff now at the idea of marijuana being a gateway drug, right. but that was a real serious idea. And so Doug Moore is looking at the world, and he know, he's very fearful of what heroin, heroin has done. He's worried about marijuana as a gateway drug. There's also a revolutionary piece to this, right? Stokely Carmichael mm -hmm. and other people are saying, we are trying to fight a revolution. The white man is trying to keep us down. We right. need all our wits about us. Uh -huh. And the drug dealers in this scenario are sort of pawns of the white man. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, and just start to then directly answer your question. So those are all real threats. And they don't know. Like at the time they're debating whether to decriminalize marijuana, it's not yet clear what the collateral consequences of a marijuana arrest and conviction will be. Like we all know the story now. Can't get student loans, can't get public housing, two and three and four times on your record, and then it's those are those mean that if you get sentenced for another offense, even if you didn't get time on the marijuana, now they're gonna look at your record and be like, oh, we're giving you a lot of time on this burglary because you had two chances on marijuana. They don't know that that's all to come. Mm -hmm. So so I'm sympathetic to somebody like that in that situation. Um, I, I do think there are people who, and I've had some conversation, uh, elected officials aren't great in my experience. You may be a better interviewer than I am. I have not found them to be great at, at admitting mistakes. Right, this um, is true, yeah. <laughs> but there have been a couple people who in private, you know, who have talked to me and who have said a little Tell bit. Tell us like, who. We, <laughs> We got swept up, you know, and, and they, you know, we, the, the, and the fears, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that the fears that they were reacting to were real. Um, so. Ted, and what, what surprised you about the, the book? And I mean, we, we, we talked about this, and, and, and you were talking about sort of the black respectability right. po uh, politics oh. that were all throughout some of the language that these folks were using in terms of this lock, or, lock em up uh, rhetoric. Yeah, and I think, and so I, I was most surprised at how unsurprised I was that mm. black leadership was being so, um, maybe so hard on their community, or at least hard on certain folks in their community. Uh, and I do think that is that sort of stems from the respectability politics from the civil rights era. Uh, you know, we were talking uh, in the in the room there about you know the mid '90s is when Bill Cosby's giving his pound cake speech, right. um, where it's the, we're, we're still talking about people pulling up their pants and speaking correct English and enunciating, and so those things weren't foreign in the black community. In fact, in fact, it was we were trying to reclaim those things as mm. this is you know this is how to be um, a good person, uh, and, and so. And, and what research shows is that um, even though black folks generally are compassionate about what happens to people in their community, when they are victims of crime, they throw the book at that person that mm. committed a crime against them. Uh, and so uh, black crime in these times were, were, was essentially our policy became a series of interpersonal interactions where we threw the book at people mm. that had this outsized cumulative effect um, codified in law. Uh, the other part of this, uh, I will say, is that um, when you're working within a, a, a system of racism, um, your, the discretion of prosecutors, judges, of everyone is sort of constrained. Uh, and so if you're in this system that's imperfect, but you have this mandate from your community to do whatever you can to clean it up, you try to use the system you have to do the best you can for your folks. And uh, I don't think people think about what will this mean in 20 years. I think they, they see, and it's a rational uh, response, is that the harder we are on these folks, the more likely they are to get their life together. Um, but the criminal justice system, especially when we talk about mandatory minimums, was never really about rehabilitation and, and fixing communities. It was about punishment. 
and uh, and and increased punishment doesn't often make things better. And clearly, um, what we saw uh, in the war on drugs is it's not even a good deterrent. And, and James, where do you think we are now? I mean, obviously, uh, the administration. We've got Jeff Sessions and Donald Trump, very much uh, rule of law and law and order, a type of administration and approach to drugs and crime. Where do you think we are? Well, I, I guess I. I think that there's there's bad news and there's good news. So the bad news is definitely at the federal level. Uh, there's been a massive. I mean, I'm critical in of President Obama, Eric Holder. I don't think they went far enough, but obviously at this point they look, you know, amazing and visionary in this regard. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but I think there's there is good news, and I think that it's important for us to remember how much success there's been. So the juvenile incarceration rate, for example, is half what it was a decade ago nationally. Uh, the death penalty, when I was in law school, the death penalty was the racial justice criminal issue of the, of the day. The, today we have one-tenth the number of death sentences being imposed every year as was true 20 years ago. Um, so these are really significant changes. Um, I, think what, I think that the populace citizens are really waking up and we miss it because Sessions and Trump so much dominate the conversation. But at the local level, I mean, if you had told me five years ago, and I'm an optimistic person, but if you had told me five years ago, okay, so here's the plan. We're going to get a whole bunch of progressive people and they're going to run for local prosecutor. And they're going to run on campaigns of ending mass incarceration and bail reform and decriminalizing low-level drug offenses. I, I would have been like, OK, I'm optimistic, but you might want to put your money somewhere else, because that's not a winning strategy. Because for 40, 50 years, the only way you ever got elected prosecutor in this country was by saying, I'm going to lock up more people than my predecessor for longer and worse conditions. But starting a couple years ago, including in the November 2016 election, around the country, a whole series of, in Georgia, Alabama, in Texas, in, in Denver, in Chicago, most recently and famously in Philadelphia, a whole bunch of people ran on campaigns that sounded like would have been revolutionary five years ago. I mean, a guy in Texas who's a career defense attorney, he has the words not guilty tattooed on his chest. Now, I'm like hardcore defense attorney. There's no not guilty <laughs> tattooed anywhere. He ran for a county prosecutor in Texas, y'all, and he won. Larry Krasner in Philadelphia is the most well-known example of this. And, and the, the reason, the only way that could have happened is because of citizen activism and citizen engagement and door knocking and just low. And, and the, here's the thing, y'all. Not that many people vote in these elections, and that's always been the thing that's hurt us. Mm -hmm. Like these are not only off year; they're like off month. <laughs> they're about to have a big. They're about to have a huge primary in California, in on June fifth. Right. Yeah. So like the, but here's if like if we all. I mean not us because DC is its own thing. But if. This number of people in most mm -hmm. places goes and vote, and we call five friends, we can get anybody elected prosecutor. <laughs> so that, the, to me, I think that that's, the, the, I think the very good news, and I actually think it's more, that is a more entrenched movement mm -hmm. than the current occupants of the White House and the de head of the Department of Justice would suggest. And Ted, you see some movement or some hope at the congressional level, and you've been meeting with folks like Jared Kushner and Van Jones, an unlikely pairing in some ways, but on prison reform, not so much. Right, right. So, uh, so this is happening, and, and this has been one of the few success stories or potential success stories in a particularly divided time. Um, there is bipartisan support for criminal justice reform, and that's the tagline. Um, as soon as you dig into what do you mean by criminal justice reform, mm -hmm. then it seems to break down a little bit. The <laughs> Mens rea. <laughs> right. That's right, exactly. That's right. Corporate right. prosecution. <laughs> so, but what seems to be um, the consensus at the moment is around pr prison reform, and that is the programs people get in, in prison, and then the ability for those folks to earn good time and be released a little early. Um, what, what's fascinated me most is um, the narrative about why people believe cri criminal justice reform is now necessary. 
Uh, on the conservative side of the aisle, prisons are an inefficient use of taxpayer funds. Uh, and so prisons are overcrowded, which means they are, they're stressing budgets, which means taxpayer dollars aren't being used wisely because they're paying for prisons and the recidivism rate is very high. It's just a bad use of dollars. Uh, and then on the liberal side, it's all the racial injustice that's happening and there's a, a sense that our communities are, are not safer and the government's not doing everything it can to, to make it so. Uh, and those two competing narratives have managed to, be, uh, to find some harmony uh, and I think that's the only way we get reform done. As soon as criminal justice reform becomes a way of undoing the, the racial disparity that was created in the war on drugs and war poverty that you cover, um, then it seems like a handout to black folks who didn't know how to act. And, the, and, and it's no longer supportable. If, the, if it's just about saving money, um, then you lose the compassionate aspect of it, and you can save money on prisons without erasing dis racial disparities, mm -hmm. uh, which, which you know, there's, you, you can't find harmony there either. Uh, and so, so I think people have agreed, well, let's just at least get folks out of prison who are there be sooner and, and, make the, and make sure that once they're out, they don't recidivate. Um, but everyone knows uh, that's looked into the problem, um, and, and, and James, you've talked about this, that if you don't do sentencing reform, you're not going to shrink prison populations. You're not going to save, the, you're not going to realize the uh, financial gains that you would otherwise. Um, and the, the prison reform tackles one small part of the problem that doesn't, doesn't really get to the core of the issue. And, and one small part of the population, right? I mean, usually mm -hmm. it's on nonviolent mm -hmm. offenders, right. um, which you, you talk about in your book, why that's problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been I've been on this point for a number of years now and it's finally starting to get traction which makes me happy. But I mean, 3 or 4 years ago, I would go to audiences and I would say, "So listen, there's one thing that we need to be clear about, which is that most people that are in our state prisons, which are 88% of the people in our prisons are in state prisons. Most people in our state prisons are in for offenses that, according to how state law and the Bureau of Justice statistics codes things, are violent offenses, not for drug offenses. And when I used to say that, people would look, look at me cross-eyed because the movement against mass incarceration has gotten a, a ton of rhetorical force out of the racism in the drug war, which is absolutely true and present. Um, but some people have gone too far, I think, in that direction and say, you know, most of the people in our prison are there for drug offenses, which is true for the federal system, but that's a that's 12%, not 88%. And so we're only now, and the problem with that, the problem with framing everything around nonviolent drug offenders, I mean, lots of problems, um, but one of them is just the numbers. You're not going to get to the biggest part of the system. And if, but more than that, if we don't, if we're not able to articulate a vision of justice reform that encompasses everybody who's incarcerated, which doesn't mean the same solution for everybody, right. but it's got to encompass everybody, we end up drawing the same distinctions between deserving and undeserving that the other side drew, which led us to be in the place that we're in now. And you see it over and over again. People then, we lose our capacity for, for love and for mercy and for compassion for people based on the charged offense and I, for, or the offense of conviction. And I'm just not, myself, I'm not willing to go down that road um, because I've met too many people in my life who are, you know, Brian Stevenson has been talking about this for decades. Mm -hmm. You know, we, none of us would want to be defined by the worst thing that we've ever done. He, he said that in a speech when I was in law school in the early 1990s, and I was like, sign me up to be a public defender. So, but we have to take that really seriously. Because it's like we can say it rhetorically, but then when people do something that we don't like, right? right then it's like you know we want to you know and this and 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 right we have to be clear about this. I, you see this this sort of um, we can see this rhetoric in in race right? Like I'm Yale's campus and there's a woman you know y'all probably saw this a woman that called the police on, right on the black woman who was sleeping. And that's terrible. 
And there has to be accountability for that. But there's been a whole lot of language around campus about that wants to define the woman that called the police. Her whole being mm -hmm. is the, then wants to be defined by that moment. Right. And it's exclusion, it's expulsion, it's get rid of you, you are a racist forever and ever, and I don't want to have any conversation with you about anything else. And I say, look, if that's not my position about armed robbery, it's also not my position about a racist phone call. Mm. Doesn't mean we don't have accountability. We have to. But what's the content of that? Are we moving towards restoration and redemption and community building? Or are we moving toward labeling and expulsion and lifetime of exclusion and civic death? So what does that actually look like? I mean, in terms of an approach to criminal justice, an approach to people who commit crimes or they sell drugs. I mean, I mean, have you seen kind of programs that implement some of the things you're talking about here? Absolutely. So let me, I mean, I think we could speak about this on a lot of levels, but um, so there's a small but I think powerful and growing restorative justice movement um, that needs to be better funded and better supported. This is one of the problems, is that all of the alternatives get funded on like a one-year grant for $200,000 and then have to go up and do Do More 24 to ask you all for $24 to buy books. Meanwhile, the budget line for the police and the prosecutors and the corrections is dedicated and going on forever and infinite. And so we really have to sustain some of these programs. For example, in Brooklyn, there's a program called Common Justice. Um, and it's a restorative justice program that's aimed, that doesn't exclude anybody based on the severity of the offense, so it can be a violent offense. Um, and what it's about is, the, the theory is, let's not just figure out who did it and then punish them. Let's ask who caused the harm, what was the harm? What do we need to restore and rebuild this community? That involves apology, mm -hmm. right? That involves uh, direct, very, sometimes very emotional kind of confrontation. Uh, it involves people owning up to what they've done, the harm they've caused. These are, we're talking, there's lots of different forms. It can be victim offender mediation. It can be peace circles where people come together from the community. And it can be incredibly powerful, especially in communities of color, because it's true what you said, absolutely, Ted, about kind of we throw, you know, our, our impulse is to throw the book. But partially that's because the only other option that we've ever given people is right, is like not, not do nothing, mm -hmm. see that history of under enforcement that I described right. where the police don't show up, or 30 years in prison. But a lot of people, you know, in communities of color, know, know somebody who's locked up. And they know that's not really good. They don't want that necessarily, but they don't want nothing. Um, and so, uh, last thing I'll say on this, but I'll just keep it really short. But one of the stories that I tell at the end of the book is of a young man that I represented who committed an armed robbery, but who we were able to get into a counseling and job training program that was run by a pastor out of his church in Southeast DC. And when I went to the man that he robbed to ask him if he would be willing to go along with this alternative sentence, it's a long story that, I'm gonna, that I'll keep super short here, but, but, but the point that I wanna make is he was willing to give my client Dante a second chance once he knew that Dante had apologized in a real authentic way, which he had, and once he knew that there was an alternative for him that seemed to the victim like it actually might lead to Dante turning his life around. So to me, those are like the two pieces. You have to have apology, real apology, and you have to have, we have to be offering some alternative pathway so that we can say to the victim, listen, if you, choose, if you go along with the non-prison route here, there's a good chance that this young man now, instead of being locked up, is going to go on into carpentry, into woodworking, into construction, into college.
Ted, is, is it your sense, and you've been talking to folks on the Hill about different bills and different approaches to prison reform, is it your sense that part of the willingness to grapple with this is because we are in a very uh, low crime period, right? It's the, it's the crime decline, right? And, and do you worry that if crime were to go back up, that some of these approaches might go out the window and we'd be back uh, where we were before in terms of the tough on crime approach? Yeah, so I think uh, certainly to the, the, the latter part of that question, it depends on who's doing the crime. Um, we've talked a lot, or at least the nation is talking a lot about the disparity in response to the crack epidemic mm -hmm. of the 80s and now the opium epidemic. Right. Uh, so drug use in the 80s resulted in mass incarceration of black men. Drug use today results in compassion for those. So, so I think if, if crime were to increase, it would depend on who the, the criminals are mm -hmm. that would sort of dictate what the policy would look like. Um, and, you know, I, I think what, what James was saying is exactly right on, uh, particularly when it comes to what happens to folks once they leave. Now that we're on this downslope of, of, uh, of crime, the crime rate, uh, when folks are released, they don't lose that scarlet letter from being incarcerated. So the opportunities uh, aren't there for them. And if you don't create opportunities, then you, you sort of put them in this stew of, of, um, of you know, where, the, where recidivism is probably more likely. Um, and if nothing else, um, you, you create a situation where that, that isn't good for the country or, or for those folks. I saw a stat today um, from the Economic Policy Institute that said the unemployment rate in D.C. for white citizens was 1.5%. For black citizens, 12.9% wow. in D.C. Um, and then if you, and that doesn't include the incarcerated population. So if you include black DC residents that are locked up, you're now over 20%. Uh, and those, those folks that are locked up have a hard time finding a job. But if you're not locked up and in walking around DC, you have a hard time finding a job. So when we think about criminal justice reform, it's not just about prison reform, and, and even not just about sentencing reform, but it's sort of the whole mix of what our society looks like and how do we uh, reincorporate people into society and create a, an inclusive nation such that those folks uh, where crime is the, a, an unattractive option, that you know, they've got other things to, to sort of pursue. I think what a lot of the reform efforts are trying to do is, is, is create hope and opportunity in those that are, are leaving prison um, and hoping that reducing the recidivism rate will sort of take care of some of our, our incarceration problem. Um, but but that, that won't be enough. And uh, we, we are going to have to figure out the, the, the way to address criminal justice is to, is to fix some of the larger socioeconomic issues we have in our society, uh, specifically around race and, uh, and economic inequality. Can I say one thing yeah. just on this? Because um, when you're talking about reintegration and you know, you're talking about prison reform, and, and I do think that one of the things that we should all think about is what can we as individuals do? Because there's, you know, there's so much, there's congressional legislation, mm -hmm. it feels like so hard to touch in some ways. And I said, okay, well, voting for progressive, you know, DAs, but that doesn't even really, that doesn't apply in DC necessarily. I mean, Carl Racine, great attorney general, definitely vote for him. Um, mm -hmm. But, oh, I, Brennan Center, that was not the Brennan Center. That was James <laughs> Foreman, <laughs> professor of law, Yale, that was not CNN was or the Brennan Center. Winner, yep. uh, but, but we can all, you know, I, we can all do something about people who, about how people who are incarcerated are treated, the experience that they have, and what that is like on, when they're leaving as well. So, you know, Free Minds, one of the organizations we've talked about here, does that work. My own work, I started teaching a class. I've been going around saying, you know, what, what can individuals do? And then I started thinking, well, what can I do? And so I started teaching a class. I teach a class on race in the criminal justice system. And then a couple years ago, I decided, let me take this class inside a local prison. And so now I teach the same class that I used to teach in the law school, but I teach it inside a Connecticut prison and another one inside a federal prison. And it's a seminar, so the only difference is Instead of 20 law students sitting around the Yale Law School, I'm in the prison with 10 students who are incarcerated and 10 law students. And it's part of the inside, it's a program national called Inside Out Prison Exchange. And for me, it's been absolutely transformative in my experience as a teacher.
you know, I, I always tell my colleagues, don't do this for self-interested reasons. I do get the best teaching evaluations that I've ever gotten in this class. But really, what the ones that matter are from the incarcerated students, because they talk about exi exactly this. They talk about, one young man wrote at the end of his semester, he said, I like the law and the policy that we learned, but what I really loved was that when I entered the seminar circle, I was treated like I had something to say. Mm. I was treated like I was smart, and I was treated like, and on some days I even felt like an intellectual. And I never felt that way in school before. These educational opportunities, right, and there are other things that you people can do, tutoring, mentoring, uh, uh, letter writing, book clubs, there are things that individual people can do to try to break down these barriers that exist between the outside world and the incarcerated world. And that's part of what prepares people then for a lifetime of success. For every dollar that we invest in education for people who are incarcerated, we get, as a society, five dollars in return. Yeah, and I would just say there that, um, so on in, in Congress and in the White House, um, a couple Is of things on the are, table? yeah, one of the okay. things they're pushing, so you, if you've been to a prison, you know it's difficult to get into prison. Yes. And so those are arbitrary rules, really. Yes. I mean, they say it's for security's sake, but if you've been volunteering or teaching out of prison for weeks on end, um, you shouldn't have to apply and, and apply for letters of recommendation and all these other things just to get in the prison to volunteer. So, so the executive branch is looking at removing some of those restrictions that oh. make visiting prisons so difficult. What's That's missing in the, in the bill in Congress, the First Step Act, First Step Act is that um, the, there is no money set aside for prison states to work with volunteer organizations to fund those efforts. So it's just sort of like we encourage these things, wardens go find people to partner with on a volunteer basis. Uh, so when you find volunteers, um, you know, if, if it's cost prohibitive, that's a problem. There's no funding associated with it. So wardens, what's the incentive for them to reach out? Uh, and then the, the other part of it is if they find the money, these volunteer organizations, and they have the commitment, then they have to go through this huge administrative exercise just to get access to the prison, mm -hmm. and uh, and sometimes that becomes prohibitive. Uh, so uh, there are but there this, are those little the, rules. But you this can is remove. the problem with the bipartisan reform, in the sense of when one side is their rationale is saving money, because some of the things that we need to do right. cost do money. cost yeah. money. Yeah. Right. 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 So we're going to turn it over to the audience. Uh, the folks have questions. You can line up at the microphones uh, here. Really? No, really? No, no. OK, there you go. There you go. All righty, sir. And if you want to state your name and then your question, that'd be great. My name is Richard Hill. Uh, my question uh, uh, revolves around the money and the responsibility of, uh, when you say, James, of who it is to fix this problem. Mm -hmm. State by state, the scope of the problem, um, in some ways, is a much uh, broader than even, uh, say, trying to fix health care at the state level and then looking at it on a federal um, uh, level. How do you see or, or who would be tasked with coming up with the actual solutions for and the, the, the group of people that would most be affected that are incarcerated to say, all right, here's the list of thing, uh, types of offenders that we're going to um, then let out based on some, some type of programs and so forth, and then have the accountability and the responsibility for taking that on. And I don't know why there would, what would be the incentive for a politician to step out there on that. Uh, there's a lot of ways I see it going south. I don't see much upside in it for, for a group to sponsor or underwrite that, even at the state level, let alone mm. at the federal level. Well, I guess, to go to Ted's point, I mean, I do think there are two main things that bring, t that you said, what would be the incentive? I think there are two main incentives that are driving people in this space right now. One is the moral and the, racial the, and the racial justice case being a big part of the moral argument for um, th that there's something wrong with a country having 5% of the world's population and 23% of its prisoners. 
And so, and the racial disparities that are part of that. So for, for me, that's what brings me to the table. Other people, uh, and in Texas, for example, where they've had pretty significant uh, reduction in prison population and, pre and pretty significant criminal justice reform, a lot of it has been Republican-led, and a lot of it has been on the economic rationale, because I said that the programs cost money, and that's right. true. But it's also true that the prisons cost money, and that if you if you reduce the number of people who are incarcerated, you save money. Now, my mission is to recapture that money that we're saving and to put it back into communities. Uh, that's the Marshall, you know, the Marshall Plan point. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think I, I think that's right. Those to me, those are the two incentives, and then. What's going to be, you said, you know, who's going to be moving on this? So much of that is state to state. And it really varies. I mean, in Connecticut, for example, one of the huge drivers where crime has declined for 25 years straight, we have the, one of the huge drivers right now, and the reason why the prison population, which has declined, but it hasn't declined as much as crime has declined, is not because of new people being sentenced. It's because of people who are out on parole getting revoked and put back into prison. And that's the parole board. And those are gubernatorial appointees. And so there, Connecticut could all by itself reduce its prison population by about another 30 or 40 percent if the governor would put people on the parole board who are more compassionate and don't think that every time you miss an appointment means you should be violated and you should be reincarcerated. But the other answer is going to be different. You know, that's the Connecticut answer. In other places, the drivers of the prison population are going to be different things. But I think what's going to bring people, what's going to give people the incentive are one of these two motivations that, that Ted suggested. And I, again, I don't want to be unduly optimistic, but we should be clear that a bunch of states, New York, California, Texas, New Jersey, Connecticut, states have reduced their prison population over the past decade 20 and 30 percent, during which time they've also, in all of those states, seen crime declines of even greater numbers. So don't believe anybody who tells you that if you reduce the prison population, then you know crime is going to have to go up. So I think the, tr the movement is in our direction. I just think it's going much too slowly, and we're starting out with a number that's so impossibly large that even 20 and 30 percent declines, yeah. we're still left with a grotesquely large yeah. number. Was it like 2.3 million or yeah. something like that? Um, sir, Thank your question? Yes, Thandor Miller, uh, coach with Freemind. Oh, great. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, if we believe that education is the great eraser, or education is the great equalizer. I would like to hear your thoughts on um, uh, the fact that we are spending more money in prisons. And um, uh, I want to hear your thoughts on uh, what, I, what, I, what I coin uh, the push out rate, rather than calling it a dropout rate, because mm. there's information now that tells us that uh, the experiences that um, children of color are having in elementary school already sets them on a trajectory that by ninth grade they're going to drop out. So I would just like to hear your thoughts around, around that. Prisoner pipe. Yeah, so, well, and, and I think uh, it's, it's uh, Tressa McMillan Cotton, who's a, a professor at VCU. Mm -hmm. um, she, in her book, Laura Ed, uh, talks about the education gospel, which she pulls from, from somewhere else. Um, but, but it's this idea that education can solve anything. It's almost like this, this is, it's the holy grail for whatever ails us. Go get some school and, and think it'll make things better. Um, and we know that because um, there is huge racial disparities within the quality of education provided to our children, just getting an education isn't, isn't enough. Uh, so education is part of the answer. And, and today is the anniversary of Brown v. Board. So I, it's, oh, wow. it's the questions apropos. Uh, but what we also know from Brown v. Board and the reporting of folks like Nicole Hannah-Jones at New York Times is that segregation still exists, that the educational opportunities for black and brown children is, is still below that of, uh, of that available to white children. And so e if you have an, an unequal education apparatus, uh, 
Um, and then I just talked about employment numbers for, for D.C., but across the nation for the last several decades, black unemployment has been twice the rate of white unemployment since forever. Uh, so th the education alone isn't enough. Even if we manage to find a way to make that equal, it's not enough if the job opportunities aren't there. Let's say we find the right education mix uh, and employment mix, but if housing segregation isn't addressed, then we find ourselves in this problem. So, so education is absolutely necessary, but it is not the silver bullet to solve this problem. It is one of a, of a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach to equality that we're going to have to address if we re really want to, to um, re reduce the prison to, 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 uh, or the, the school to prison pipeline, or at the dropout rate or push out rate, as you put it. Thank you, sir, for that question. Uh, Glare in Brazil. Uh, just a question: What can those of us in like churches and in religious communities do, or have you seen in your in your work and in your research? You know, how can we you know contribute to re resolving this problem? Thank you for that that question. So, I think there's a lot of there are a lot lots of things, and churches, some churches have as part of their kind of political action agenda to uh, to do volunteering, to do educational programs in prisons. I think those are all really important. You know, voter registration and voter mobilization. I think uh, I'm involved with a group in Connecticut that's trying to uh, lead the effort to uh, in to re have people register to vote who have been incarcerated, and a lot of churches are involved in that. But even more concretely, you know, we have this, when we think about the size of our, this, this problem, it can seem so overwhelming. So, for example, we have, you know, 800,000 people every year because of the cycling, especially of jails, who are released from some sort of institution every year, whether it's a prison or a jail or a halfway house. And we know when you're coming back exactly how hard that can be to reintegrate, to, to get a to get a license. Um, you can't do anything if you don't have a license and then you go to DMV and it's like it costs $30 and people say it's $30. Well, <laughs> if you don't have any dollars, then $30 is a million dollars. Mm -hmm. You don't have it. And But here's the thing. So we have 300,000 in this country, uh, churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, religious institutions. That means that if every single religious institution in this country were to adopt three people, a year coming back to that community and say, we're going to be your home. We're going to, be, we're going to help you reintegrate. We're going to help you find a job. We're going to help you get the clothes that you need. We're going to help you register for classes. We're going to help you get that ID. We're going to be your home. That, that would be transformative. And that's three, you know, I'm not asking, that, that's, I'm not saying adopt 3,000, I'm not saying adopt 300, I'm saying adopt three. Mm -hmm. So if we, so, so that would be my, you know, my pitch would be in addition to some of these other things, directly say that we are going to adopt a number of people who are re-entering, and we are going to do everything mm -hmm be that place for all of their needs, help them with everything from housing to jobs to getting their, uh, ba back with their children, all of the obstacles. No. Sir, your question? Yeah. Hi, I'm Kate Tipton. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. So James, you were touching on the myths around nonviolent drug offenders being the leading cause of mass incarceration. So what I want to hear you all talk about is uh, why the standard story has been pe perpetuated for so long. About the, what, the non-violent drug offenders? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, so part, part of it, uh, do, do you mind, I don't want to embarrass you, like, yeah, how old you are, or just give us a uh, rough. Thank you. I'm 24. Thank okay. <laughs> The reason that I ask is that I actually don't even really think it's been that long because it was a breakthrough to even get people. I mean, you'll see this when you if when you look at the book, the whole term nonviolent drug offender in the 90s in this city in Superior Court. If you walked around talking about nonviolent drug offenders, they'd say, counselor, who's have you not read the newspaper? Have you not seen all the bodies falling in the crack wars? What nonviolent drug offender? We didn't, we could, I did not utter that phrase. Mm 
in, in, and nobody did. You would get your head cut off by some judges. So it was a great victory of the movement against mass incarceration to even get people to think that there was a category, drug offenders, that we should show some compassion for. So I don't really think it's even been that long. And I wanna, and I don't wanna like, I don't wanna be quick to like dump on, is like, that should be held up as a great rhetorical success that has moved our country in some really significant, in important directions. Having said that, why do, and why do I think it's been so effective? I think it's precisely because for a nonviolent drug offender, the answer that we have, we don't need an alternative, we don't need to build an alternative answer. Nia, you were saying, so what should we do, mm -hmm. right? What do those programs look like when I'm talking about restoration and it's a little fuzzy and it's hard to, well, we don't need to answer that question because we should just do nothing. Stop arresting, stop incarcerating, right? For the nonviolent drug offenders, we actually have an answer. It, where it gets harder for us is when it's violence, when it's robbery, and even yet more serious, because then we really do need alternatives. The answer cannot be nothing. For the person who's uh, selling or, or possessing or even selling drugs with no violence attached to it, it's like, leave them alone. So I think that, and the other reason why I think it's rhetorically been so effective is that it's the category where we really know definitively that the rates of use are equal across racial lines as compared to the rates of arrest and prosecution being so un unequal. It, things don't break down so easily when we start talking about offenses like robbery or armed robbery, because there we do have racial disparities, not just in incarceration rates, but also in rates of offending. Mm -hmm. And that's a more complicated conversation. So I think that's the other reason. Thank Great, thank you for that question, and sir. Uh, uh, thank you. We talked a lot about um, programs and policy solutions and legal solutions, mm -hmm. but how in our communities do we um, start to have conversations about in people-to-people in -people interactions, moving from a paradigm of fear mm -hmm. and retribution and punishment to one of love and compassion and empathy. Um, and as part of that, for both you, Professor Foreman and, and Nia, how do we incentivize those who, who tell stories and the way we communicate to change the lexicon that we use to talk about the people who interact with the criminal legal system? Um, the people who you teach in classes aren't uh, prisoners or detainees, they're students and people. And the people who are released aren't felons or criminals, but um, people who have interacted with the criminal legal system. I don't really know how to do it, but to do it. So in other words, I just try to model it. Like I, so for me, I agree with you, absolutely. Um, so what I've tried to do is I've tried to, I don't, I'm looking for the book to point, I've tried to tell stories. Um, I, think that, I think that telling individual stories are incredibly powerful in this. I mean, the best example of this to me is, is The Wire. So, um, you know, President Obama used to frustrate me to no end because I'd always see him up there and he'd be talking about, we're talking about nonviolent offenders here with this reform. Now, I don't have any sympathy for the violent offenders. And, and I would be like, oh man, come on, you're missing it. I love you, but man, are you missing this one? And then I saw an interview, he announced all that. And then like the next day, he was talking to David Simon in the White House, they were sitting down. And he was said his favorite television show is The Wire, <laughs> and all the characters in The Wire and how much he loves them. And I was like, who's nonviolent in The Wire? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the, really, there's nobody, yeah, Bubbles. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. And even he is a little Bubbles, shaky. Yeah, he's a little sketchy, yeah. Right, exactly, for mostly. <laughs> but, but President Obama, did not view that as, a di as brilliant as he is, didn't view any kind of disconnect there. Why? Because exactly your reason. He saw them as individuals who may have, right, if he, you pushed him on it, he'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, he, he did do that, yeah, okay. But he didn't define them as violent offenders because they were people with complex histories, stories, constraints on their lives, abuse that they had suffered, limited options available to them. 
And they had made some choices that were bad and in some cases caused great harm. But that's, a, that's, 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 that's different. That's, you're not labeled. You don't become that category. So I think, you know, in my mind, the only way to do it is, by, is to continue to lift up these stories and to avoid that labeling language in the way that you just modeled. And I don't, you know, I don't use, I endeavor, I mean, I might slip up now and again for shorthand or because it's deeply embedded, but I try really hard uh, to not, you know, to not talk about people by a label. You know, I talk about people who, may, who have been incarcerated, um, but I don't talk about felons, you know. That's not the way that I, that's not the language that I use. Yeah, and the only thing I would add is that um, whenever policy dis discussions and decisions are happening, um, folks who've been incarcerated should be part of that discussion. Thank you. Uh, because if you try to fashion policy and, uh, and you have no exposure, aside from what you've read, um, then you're, you're probably not the right person to, or at the very best, the solution you come up with will not address the, the, the folks that need it most. So um, they need to be at the table. Great. Sir? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Tech Michael from the British International School. Uh, you said earlier that you were a, that you wanted to be a public defender because you thought that was kind of like the new, your generation's version of the civil rights movement. Mm. Uh, just taking a little further back, do you think that mass incarceration is just this generation's version of slavery? I certainly think, you know, for me, I personally don't find his, I don't find a historical analogy in quite that way to be, at least for me, so helpful in understanding the issue. Because I never know, but it always depends on what people mean when they say, well, it's this generation's slavery. So if, what, if the question is, is it, the, is it the, a profound racial injustice of this moment, mm -hmm. then yes, it is. And if we need to make to sort of frame it that way to like grab somebody people's attention, then I'm then I wouldn't. It's not how I would exactly define it. Um, but what, I don't. What about the new Jim Crow? Would that it, be is that closer or is it yeah, the it's, same? Yeah, it's closer. Thing? It's clo I think yeah. it's closer. Yeah. I do think it's closer. Um, so yeah, but I guess for me, I don't really know. I don't know what the stakes are. Like when somebody asks that question, like, is it this generation's slavery? I'm not sure what the stakes are behind that que like behind that question. So I guess I would need to know more. Um, so if you're asking me again, is it a profound racial injustice of this moment? Absolutely. Is it morally, uh, you know, m m deeply morally objectionable? And should we call upon? all of our ability collectively to fight it, absolutely. Um, for me, when I think about slavery, uh, its horrors are, to me, feel kind of unique and, and overwhelming. And I don't want to lose my ability to talk about, to talk about them. Um, so I want to hold space to be like specific when I talk about what it means to be bought, sold, bred for profit, what it means to be at auction block, having your child ripped away from you, sold to the highest bidder. I, I, I want to have space to be really specific mm -hmm. about what that means. And as long as we can hold on to the space to do that, uh, I'm for the analogies if they bring more people to the conversation. Okay. All righty. Sir, your question? Hey. I'm a um, Free Minds Book Club member, and I've been for... I've What's been, your name? My name is David Williams. Okay. I'm also a returning citizen. And um, my question kind of piggybacks off the question I was asked before the young man about... My question is, to, the, to all of you guys, the entire panel, um, what do you think can be done legally to change like the negative perspective of you know, returning citizen, people that come home from prison that has a felony, that's trying to apply for jobs and stuff like that. Like, what do you think legally can be done to change that? Ted, you want to take that one? Uh, well, I think some of the efforts that are happening are good. Uh, so ban the box is the first thing that immediately comes to mind where when you're applying for jobs, they can't ask you before they've even met you 
um, what your prior status was. Right. Uh, and so that way, this is, it, it at least allows you, uh, it almost forces folks to get to know who you are before they, they put that label on you, which causes them to judge you prematurely. You I will say, though, even though they do have the band in the box, I've myself experienced three times since I've been home not being asked that question, but still having a background check ran on me and right. been denied, you know, um, employment because of a background check. Oh, I, I believe it. Yeah, and so, so that's that's a step. But you're right; it's not going to erase the problem. I mean, one, there's gonna, they're going to look at your resume and say, "What? What? Where's the gap? There's a gap here. What's right. happening?" Uh, and the other part of this is they, they can look at your name and say, "You know, there's there's lots of research that shows just if you have a black sounding name that you're less likely to get a call back." Uh, but I think one of the, a few of the success program or successful programs I've heard of are things when, uh, when folks are incarcerated, not only do they give you job training, but then they match you to a job when you leave. Uh, and so that way you don't, you're not left to fend for yourself when you're out there looking for a job, that there's a job waiting for you based on a partnership between a, a, a business and the prison. The, the problem is, as we mentioned, there's no money for those programs, and they're on a volunteer basis, and so a company has to sort of be proactive in that regard. And it's happening at some prisons. Um, it, it wouldn't surprise you that the prison populations where that's most common tend to be in places like upstate Michigan, where there's not a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of black folks. Uh, so, so I, I, but I do think there are some administrative actions at the state and local level um, that they, that can be taken to sort of remove the stigma. But ultimately, it's a work of of society's heart, um, where we have to realize that, um, and, and telling stories is part of changing people's minds about who you are instead of uh, believing what they've seen on TV. And I don't know that you can legislate out of people's behavior or legislate into people's behavior compassion for, for folks that have been through a different experience. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a long-term effort that's going to require um, good examples of, of success stories and, you, and folks telling their stories about, um, uh, and about who they are and, and what happened to them. And I, I would just say that, again, in terms of like legally, because you know you started with that, in addition, uh, and I think this might have been what you were talking about with administrative, there are a lot of like, there are a lot of states that have NCs that have li requirements for getting licenses, whether it's, you know, New York is one of the worst, you know, to get a license to drive a cab, to get a license to barber, to get a license to do 251 different occupations in New York. To get a license, you have to uh, clear, have a clear criminal record, including all kinds of things that where it's not, it seems mass, really irrelevant. Um, so that's a p thing that can be done legally. I do agree with Ted fundamentally. It's about lifting up voices like yours to change people's minds for employers. Because even with Ban the Box, as you know, there's going to be a point where they're going to find out. And the real question is, what about then? So for example, uh, and employers can go much further than simply banning the box. They need to be more inclusive and affirmatively reach out to people. So the Ford Foundation does this all this work on criminal justice reform around the world. And they were giving a presentation at a prison in New York. And they had all their leadership there, including the head of the Ford Foundation. And they were showing what they did. And one of the guys who was incarcerated raised his hand at the end of the presentation. He said, thank you. This is amazing. I'm so inspired. I just have one question. When I get out of here, could I get hired at the Ford Foundation? <laughs> That's great, yeah. And they were silenced in the room because they didn't know even what their rules were. And this is the thing. So many employers have back, it used to be in the file cabinet of the Human Resources Department. Now it's on their computer drive. They have massively overbroad. It's kind of like the New York State licensing laws. Mm -hmm. They have all these exclusions. And the Ford Foundation found that they had them. Now, to their credit, Ford went back, they scrubbed their HR policies, they got rid of about 90% of the ways in which somebody with a criminal conviction on their record would have been excluded. And then, though, this is the thing. They went further. They set up an internship program, paid internship with benefits, which they affirmatively promote mm -hmm. to people who are coming out of prison. Because one of the things is the stigma we have so fully stigmatized people and yeah. told them they're going to be discriminated against right. that sometimes people don't even apply for jobs that maybe they could get. Because as you know, but as very few people in this room probably know, it is utterly demoralizing to walk in into an employer and be treated 
like you are garbage and why did you even think you could walk into this room and think about applying for this job? simply based on something that is on your record. So we have to affirmatively go out and let people know, no, we will con we're going to learn about your record. That's, that's going to be part of the, but we are not going to exclude you simply based on that. We're going to sit down with you. We're going to interview you. We're going to learn about your history. We're going to talk to the other people in your life. When we did this, when I was first starting our school, one of the first people that we hired at the end of our, we hired four people. And at the end of our four days of, uh, five days of training, one of the four people came in and he said, David James, this is the first year of the Maya Angelou School. He said, David James, something I need to tell y'all. He was about a 20 year old guy. He said, I didn't, they didn't ask me, y'all didn't ask me this on the, on the thing, but I just need to tell you because we've been getting really close through this training and it's really personal. He was like, I'm, I'm, I've, or I'm on parole for armed robbery. And I just felt like I had to tell you. And we thought it was Friday. We thought about it over the weekend. We talked about it. We talked to his parole officer. We learned the, we got his, we learned the context of what happened. We found out lots about his background that helped us to understand him as more than that moment when he went into that store and with a knife in his pocket, took something from that store. He wasn't only that moment, and we learned that. We talked to his parole officer, and we, reflect, we reflected on it because we were a brand new school. We were working with kids. We were like, can we really do this? But then we were like, we're working with, we set ourselves up as a school of second chances for people that right. kids have been incarcerated. <laughs> How can we not do it? So we did it. We hired him. And today, 20 years later, I'm not going to name him, of course, but 20 years later, let me just say this, he is a prominent he is a significant advocate on justice reform issues. Oh, that's great. Sir? Good evening. Good evening. Oh, there uh, he is. How are you doing, Your Honor? <laughs> not, the, I, not the judge from the first story, though. <laughs> I'm Judge Burnett, former U.S. Magistrate Judge and Superior Court Judge. But I preliminarily want to mention that I was involved in the Brown case. Oh, wow. I'm the James Meredith of Virginia, and I ended up at NYU Law School as a result of Virginia paying all of my expenses to go there, and because Thurgood Marshall, who was my lawyer, neighbor, had to focus on dealing with the Little Rock situation. I was the person involved in the case in front of Little Rock. Judge Burnett, before you go further, do, you, do, do, people, do, do people know this piece of the history, this piece of time when southern states paid for highly qualified individuals who otherwise would be admitted into their state institutions and professional schools. No, I was they paid to them to, to go, go to elsewhere. schools elsewhere. Elaine Jones, there's people that went to Harvard, there's people that went to NYU because Southern schools were so desperate to keep them out. I'm sorry, Judge Burnett. As a matter of fact, I ended up at NYU with Virginia paying all my expenses, plus NYU making me a faculty scholar with me basically having two full-time scholarships and so forth. But as the only Negro or color we were then called at NYU, and as a matter of fact, three years I was there, there were only two of us. Mm. even in New York City. Mm. But then, uh, after finishing law school, two years in service, I ended up with the hottest job in the United States government. I ended up being Bobby Kennedy's personal assistant to monitor the Martin Luther King movement to make sure the Communist Party would not infiltrate and cause the second civil war in this country. Mm. I mm. won't be permitted to tell people this by Barack Obama, for whom I was a, during the eight years his judge advisor in but five different programs in the White House. But I want to give you a perspective. Back in 1964, 65, and then I became an assistant U.S. attorney here, black middle class people in this country and those that were teachers and professionals were the ones that voted. And they wanted to get rid in the community of those who were drug addicts. Mm. And therefore, they voted for black city council people and mayors who actually joined. And they looked on the drug problems 
of our minority citizens in this country as being a drag on achieving civil rights. Hmm. And indeed, in 1969, I became the first African-American United States magistrate judge. And many of them expressed that to me personally. And even when we got around to implementing the Bail Reform Act and finding people in the community who would be custodians, of, I don't want to be bothered with that guy because he's a drug dealer, he's pulling down my community, mm -hmm. he, and so forth. So our city council people, uh, as say, Dave Clark and those we, that I dealt with then, Wilhelmina Rolock, all say, we got to be responsible to those blacks who vote who don't want this problem in their community. So I, will, I just want to mention that first Thank and so you. forth. Then, in addition, today I'm the CEO of the National African American Drug Policy Coalition. And one of the five mission points is to implement and design programs for the Second Chance Program. And we are in the process of having black professionals like myself and from all of the different professions talk to Kiwanis Club talk to chambers of commerce, talk to employers. I, for example, Blessed Sacrament Church, you have a group of 75, principally white men, who in fact will live their religion in the marketplace. The organization has three churches in every ch area where they have chapters to say, just don't go to church on Saturday or Sunday, but implement your religion seven days a week with reference to help these people find affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Le put them in programs which are going to lead to a job. And I've had people give testimonials. See, that people that they have hired who came out of prison turned out to be better than running a business than their own sons or daughters. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the five-point programs of an organization that I run that covers the entire nation but to change the whole dynamic of the Second Chance Program. Mm -hmm. With our youth, we're not only dealing with the education issue and the school dropout problem. But we are, in fact, having Marion Wright Elements idea implemented. It takes a whole village to raise a child. So indeed, we just don't have mentors. We have counselor mentors who will take kids at the eighth grade level who are maintaining the B average and shepherd them just like they did their sons or daughters. Mm -hmm. So every black kid in America today who wants to be a doctor, I'm in position with the National Medical Association to give that kid a doctor to shepherd him like his own son or daughter. National Association of Black Engineers. I just attended that conference in Pittsburgh, and they are doing that for every kid who wants to go into the STEM and science and engineering field. And we're doing this for every profession. But the point is, we got to be doers and get out and not just talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so again, like I said, I don't want to say, take up too much of your time, but right now, we represent 27 member organizations, including 100 black men of America, concerned black men. Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America is one of my cooperating partners, where we are action-oriented to get this, solve the problems of not just man the box, but evaluate the individual and the service. And in many instances, the cases I handle, the person who was convicted of armed robbery was an aid and a better. They didn't even know what was going to happen before it happened and was innocent involved or was under duress and so forth. Look at the individual circumstances. So I just want to give you that perspective, but then the culture, the black community from the early 70s until about 1990 was they wanted to push the drug users and addicted out of the community because they felt that it was holding them back on yeah. civil rights advancement. Yeah. I just want to give you that perspective. Thank you so much, sir. So great to hear from you. It's eight. How are we doing on time? Should we? What are we doing? Okay, we're over. Well, I'm going to get one last question because we didn't get any questions from any women. So here, here you are, ma'am. This is great. All right. Hi, my name is Mindy Hill. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, I'm just a little confused as to we have all these reforms uh, policies. We have all these policy makers, but it seems to be a major disconnect in um, the, the outcome and solution of the effectiveness of, of what's going on. Um, we have all these Black Lives Matters groups. We have the pilot projects um, for the body-worn cameras. We have all these things. 
but it's it's a major disconnect as far as how is this really working? You know, we say money is the problem, but we've put a lot of money into reform, policy, but the outcome has not yet to equal um, something that's really beneficial. Um, and we keep, seem to keep revisiting the same thing year after year, and it's kind of, you know, we're pretty much 50 years back right about now. So I'm just a little Depressing confused. question and yeah. thought there. <laughs> I'm not sure that when you say we put a lot of money into I don't know that I necessarily really agree with you on that. So not, you know, compared to what we put into, you know, locking people up for long periods of time. I mean, again, I think about just to really ground it in the concrete and the specific. I mean, I, when we started... The Maya Angelou School, we 20 years ago, we said to the city, we said, listen, we're going to try to set up a school that is going to recruit kids that everybody else has given up on, kids that have been incarcerated, kids that have been kicked out of other schools or pushed out of other schools. And at the time, this was when we first started, the city said, that's fabulous. We really believe in that. And there was... A, but we also said, you know, it's going to cost more money because these the kids that we're working with have a lot of trauma that hasn't been treated. They're going to need extra tutoring and counseling. They're going to need more than a kid that's flowing along on track. And when we started, there was a supplement in the budget for that. Over the years, every year, that's been dwindled down and dwindled down and dwindled down. And so now we're trying to do the work of, and we're an alternative to incarceration, and we're trying to do the work, though, on a smaller budget than when we started 20 years ago, and on a much smaller budget than it takes to run a prison or jail or a halfway house. And I think you can replicate that out around across program and around the country. So in my opinion, we have to redirect resources. And I don't think it's only money. I'm not saying that. I don't think it's only money. But I do think money is then tied to other things, right? Because a big part of what we need to do is we need to rec is is human capital, right? In any of these programs, who the who is a co the coach who spoke earlier, who's part of Free Minds, these programs are only as good as the people working in them. But we need, if you can't hire people and pay them a decent salary to do r social justice, racial justice, alternative to incarceration work, if people know you can't really be paid a reliable salary in that space, then it's hard to recruit people and to keep them. All the time I see people leaving and say, I want to keep doing this work, but I just can't afford to keep doing this at these salaries. And so. I really do think it's money and the things that money buys. Um, just to piggyback on that, though, the, the, the budgeting. Um, usually when funding is allocated um, to a specific programming, um, you know, if, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do with the funding, chances are um, funding will be deducted or something like that. So are we not necessarily auditing these things to see what is really effective in the budgeting? I mean, I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm just I kind of. I wish it worked like that. I do. Yeah, I, I'm just a little lost because it's like, you know, we're still, it's like we're chasing behind the tail of, of trying to figure out a solution to problems that have been in existence for quite some time. But we have the same people at the table. And I don't know. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. We're going to have to end quickly here. Ted, do you want to just quickly? Uh, so so uh, just generally speaking, policy is how we manage the experience of discrimination uh, when, in, on issues like this. So we don't use policy to eradicate problems. We'd love it to work that way because we'd pass the perfect thing, fund it, and then never have to worry about it again. Unfortunately, there's not enough money, um, and we don't know what those ideas are, even if we had the money. Uh, so what policy tends to do is make the, the experience a little bit less worse than it was before, but not doesn't 
solve the problem. And so we're just in this perpetual cycle of managing badness instead of fixing it. Uh, and so that's why we don't get the policy solutions we want. Ultimately, it's going to take, as we were talking about earlier, a work of the heart. There's, there's a, a, a fundamental flaw in the American character uh, because uh, race, we were founded with slavery in, in sort of in our, in our DNA. Uh, and so until we work that piece of it out, these things we're seeing now are just residual effects of, uh, of not really reconciling our, our race problem. And policy is not going to fix it. Um, and so there's, there's more work to be done at a deeper level be, beyond budgets and, and, and statutes, unfortunately. Okay, great. Ted, James, we're going to have to end here. This was great. Thank, Thank you. you all for your great <laughs> questions. Uh, James is going to sign some books and probably hang around for some questions, Ted as well. Uh, and I just want to say um, that uh, you can find the Brand Center online at brandcenter.org and follow them on Facebook and Twitter. And thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you.